This is Dr. E at 45 Surf University. And here's a fun book from a couple years ago. Uh, basically, I noticed that a lot of people that were involved in what they call kind of the neo or new stoic movement were kind of discounting, ignoring, and sometimes even belittling Socrates. Uh, so basically, I wrote a book called Socrates Stoic Apology father of philosophy, stoicism, and science, son of Homer, Achilles, and Odysseus, mentor to Plato, Aristotle, Zeno, Epictetus, Seneca, Aurelius, Cato, Galileo, Bruno, and Nietzsche. Uh, so basically, what I'm saying is Socrates is where it all started. Uh, interesting enough, when you think about uh, the choice that Socrates made in the Apology, when he was basically teaching that virtue does not come from money, power, position, but rather money and every lasting good of man and power and position all ultimately derive from virtue, acting and behaving virtuously, speaking the truth, living for ideals, living honorably, living morally. He basically taught that that was the foundation of all higher wealth and civilization and all greater things and they wanted to put him to death for teaching that because the good folks of his day uh, basically said you know these teachings are corrupting the youth so they gave him a choice they said hey socrates if you keep teaching this we're going to put you to death but if you recant your teachings and stop teaching it then you can live a happy life and just go your way. And Socrates at that point, uh, you know, his friends didn't want him to die, so they're kind of encouraging him to recant his teachings and, you know, just go live quietly somewhere. But Socrates said, wait a second here. Uh, think about Achilles. Did Achilles have any thought of death or danger when it came to doing the right thing? And in Homer's Iliad, Achilles' good friend Patroclus is slain. Slain. So uh, Achilles knows, he's, he's been told, that if he returns to battle to avenge the death of his good friend Patroclus by slaying the Trojan Hector, who had killed Patroclus, then Achilles' death will soon follow. Or if he leaves the battle entirely and sails far away, he'll live a long, happy, prosperous life. But for Achilles, there's absolutely no hesitation. He returns to battle to slay Hector and avenge his good friend. So Socrates notes that, and he says, you know, not just Achilles, but all the heroes on down, his Greek heritage, they would look down at him if he turned tail and ran just because he feared for his life. So he basically said, you know, I would gladly teach this many times over and over again, even if I had to die many times over and over again. So, of course, they sentenced him to death and put him to death. But that whole idea of standing up for the truth, no matter the consequences, you could see that spirit, which began, Socrates credits Achilles, but then when you look down through Bruno, Galileo, Copernicus, uh, so much of science was advanced by people who didn't do the easy thing and didn't back down, but rather uh, stuck by their guns, stuck by the truth, and fought for it. The book description to Socrates' Stoic Apology reads, For the past 10 years or so, I have been voyaging through the West shooting epic landscape photography, magookin.com while traveling with my best friends, Homer, Socrates, Epictetus, Virgil, Einstein, the Tao, et al. This book is devoted to my good friend, Socrates. I'll never forget the day I was introduced to Socrates. It was a gray, cloudy autumn day in Princeton, one of those first days of fall when one needs a jacket. I was sitting alone in the bleachers just beyond the tennis courts as I was an hour early for tennis practice. Truth be told, I hadn't really been enjoying my philosophy class, Plato and his predecessors. 
The professor who shaved his head seemed a bit, well, professorial. But my feelings about philosophy were about to change. I was about to fall in love. I opened the text, Plato's Dialogues, and devoured the entire apology in an hour. It blew me away. And thus I learned that philosophy was better exalted in books than the Princeton Lecture Hall. Ever since then, I have always sought the original texts in poetry, philosophy, literature, and physics, and I've always sought to read as many translations as possible. Right as I finished the apology, the skies opened up and thunder and lightning canceled tennis practice for the day. I ran on back to my dorm with a renewed passion for pursuing virtue in art, physics, and philosophy. Bertrand Russell, even though a lot of the modern Stoics ignore Socrates pretty much, uh, Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher in his own right, uh, sets the record straight, writing, Socrates was the chief saint of the Stoics. Throughout their history, his attitude at the time of his trial, his refusal to escape, his calmness in the face of death, and his contention that the perpetrator of injustice injures himself more than his victim, all fitted in perfectly with Stoic teaching. So did his indifference to heat and cold, his plainness in matters of food and dress, and his complete independence of all bodily comforts. That's from Bertrand Russell in A History of Western Philosophy, 1945, Book 1, Part 3, Chapter 28, Stoicism, page 253. Ever since that introduction to the Apology, I have always seen the Stoics, physicists, and philosophers who came after Socrates to be students of Socrates. And thus Socrates became my spiritual guide and mentor as he taught me to imitate Achilles in considering not death nor danger, but only acting with virtue while courageously speaking the truth, come hell or high water. The esteemed Alfred North Whitehead noted, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. I do not mean the systematic scheme of thought which scholars have doubtfully extracted from his writings. I allude to the wealth of general ideas scattered through them, his personal endowments, his wide opportunities for experience at a great period of civilization, his inheritance of an intellectual tradition not yet stiffened by excessive systematization, have made his writing an inexhaustible mine of suggestion. That's Alfred North Whitehead, Process and Reality, page 39, Free Press, 1979. And so it is that this book exalts in celebrating Socrates' primal text, The Apology. I have been saddened to see the popular marketing Stoics, McStoics, ignoring, discounting, and belittling Socrates. But such is the way of the world, and Socrates knew it, as he stated that he would gladly die many times over rather than ever cease teaching his truth. Socrates calmly looked rejection and death in the face and stated, Either acquit me or not, but whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways, not even if I have to die many times. And yet, the marketing Stoics, McStoics, ignore this wonderful teaching that virtue does not come from money, as they exalt their sordid bottom line in the machinations above Socrates' higher soul. Socrates compared himself with Achilles, the primal Greek hero, as he made philosophy an heroic act, thusly exalting science in Western civilization too. Join us. So I hope you enjoy the book, Socrates' Stoic Apology, Father of Philosophy, Stoicism, and Science. Uh, basically, I, uh, the book kind of uh, has the whole apology included, and I also introduce a lot of my photography and thoughts on uh, the actual apology as we go through the book. One of the reasons I kind of left academia to pursue photography is that I found photography to naturally embody so many stoic qualities and also qualities of the Tao. And those include the fact that 
photography is expressed in action. I mean, when you look at a picture, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but it's not something that is ultimately talked about. It, it kind of, uh, I think that Ansel Adams uh, stated that we will uh, use words as long as the words do us well. And when the words no longer work, we will use photographs. And it's that whole idea of pursuing something that's ethereal, ineffable, and exalted beyond thought and language and words. And every time you shoot a photograph, it, it exists independently of basically thoughts, words, uh, what people think about it. And, you know, you can't, you can't market a photo any more than how good the photograph already is. And no talking about it is going to improve it one way or the other, nor detract from it. I mean, definitely people always try, but I get that sense and that feeling that photography embodies the Tao and uh, Stoicism. Uh, and the fact that, you know, both of them, both of the teachers of the Tao and Stoicism, they place action over words, uh, the value of action over words. And photography places the value of action over words. If you don't get up at 5 a.m. and hike 10 miles uh, up the hill to get there on time when the light's just right on the waterfall, you don't get the shot. And I, I really love that about photography, where it seems so much other stuff, uh, you know, thing, things can be played, algorithms can be skewed, marketing can be committed, I suppose is a good word for it. And, uh, you know, things, things can be twisted. But once you go down that road, I think, I think you lose the higher soul, the higher good. And I love the Stoics and uh, the Tao as they, they both teach us of that. Uh, one of the tenets of the Tao states that he who speaks of the Tao does not know it. And he do, who does not speak of it knows it best. And I think that that's... Uh, you can find a lot of that in photography. That the photographers who really know what they're doing, they, they don't talk about it a whole lot, uh, but rather they let their photography speak for themselves. Whereas there's a lot of others, I, I kind of call them photographers, like talk instead of tog. So it's that whole idea that uh, you know they, they spend way too much time talking about photography compared to the small amount of time they spend doing it and I mean to each his own uh, it's perfectly fine but I do think that that principle of the Tao that those who talk most about something know at least the same with stoicism often it is the ones who are writing the most about it or the ones practicing it the least because uh, stoicism is all about pursuing truth and virtue over all else and not just writing about pursuing truth and virtue and then marketing it, but it's actually taking action. And I think that the realm of art is a place where the mortal soul can pursue truth and action. Uh, I think that, you know, I mean, definitely language provides us that too. When you look at uh, eternal poetry, Homeric poetry and all that, that's a great thing too. But uh, merely rebranding or recalling like the precepts of the Tao and Stoicism uh, that that has never quite appealed to me and for me uh, you know I humble myself uh, before all those great philosophers Epictetus and Socrates and everyone who came before and I kind of see uh, the pursuit of photography as a way to uh, honor all the things they said not not just in words but also in deeds uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed the book, and uh, this is Dr. E at 45 Surf University.